Hey guys, welcome to 2 Corinthians, the first day in a whole new book. Okay, so this is the introduction and chapter one of 2 Corinthians. I decided to leave the verse for tomorrow because I didn't want to make this so long, including the introduction and then including um, the verse, then including chapter one. Okay, so I'm going to get into um, the background of this book, why it was written. Obviously, we know who it was written from, Paul. But why was this book written after he wrote 1 Corinthians already and then get into the very first chapter. So welcome and Hope that you guys learn as much and more than we've been learning, okay? That we keep advancing together. Let's pray and then we'll get started. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today and thank you for each of the students. Thank you so much for Angela and for Kelly, for Ashley and Ismar, for Jose and Junior and Sadi and Paula. I pray that you be with each of them this week. I pray that you help them. I pray that you be with Jose as he's over um, in Seba. I pray that you be with um, each of the students as they plan out how they're going to, to do their projects this week, that you help them to have the focus, have the determination, have the um, strength and the energy to do the best and do it all with excellence. Lord, please give them their time management skills that they need and help them to remember the things that they learned. I pray that you be with us today as we enter a new book to study in your word. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the way that you have um, put your precious Bible in this world so that we can learn your living word and know what you want us to do in our lives. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's do this thing. We first want to start out with an introduction so we understand the context of 2 Corinthians and it's good to take notes on this as well because when you go back to do your summary that you should be able to see, remember why um, Paul was even writing this book. So you remember the church of Corinth, I'm about to show you the map again about exactly where it is. They had a lot of problems and that a lot of it was due to the fact that they were in a very sinful area of the world um, that had different gods, had a lot of um, open sin of just, you know, they lived the way that they wanted to live, that they weren't accountable to God, but they were allowing that to get inside the church. And so Paul had to write a very strong letter to them to explain to them the things that they were doing incorrectly. So time went by, and at first they weren't exactly applying those things, but then Titus came. Remember, we, we talked about um, Paul's plan to send Titus, Tito, right, another pastor that was under him, a lot like Timothy, to the Corinthians when Paul couldn't get there yet to guide them and to be their pastor and to be a shepherd to them to get them back onto the right track. Um, for a while, Titus didn't um, was not able to communicate to Paul, but then time came where um, the good news came from Titus that yes, they were starting to implement the things that um, Paul had explained to them in the letter. So things were advancing. The problem was, um, though that there was another problem on the side, though it was resolved, okay, the problem was that after Paul had written the first letter, there had come people inside Sembrando Discordia um, about Paul, it's especially saying that, you know, he wasn't really an apostole, that he, apostolo, he wasn't really, um, um, did not have the authority that people thought that he had had. So they were really just, what is that word, like, ceniza? No sé la palabra en español. But, like, where you're just, like, what do they say, like, also echando tierra? Like, sembrando discordia, right? Making them doubt that Paul had the spiritual authority above them, that Paul was really, like, a, a disciple, and that he really um, was preaching the truth, right? So... Even though they were going to start to implement the things that Paul had taught them um, about how to be better Christians, there was still this doubt. Titus was explaining to them, explaining to Paul that there was this doubt um, about Paul's authority as an apostle. And so he 
felt led from the Holy Spirit to write a second letter defending his apostleship is what we say defending the fact that he was a disciple that God had chosen him and that yes he did have spiritual authority over them to help them be better people for God and that's what we're going to see a lot of the focus in um, Corinthians as well as other things it's not all about that okay so let's take a deeper look look there's the map again where Corinth is very close to Athens in Greece right um, in the Mediterranean Sea. So he had written the first book of Corinthians from Ephesus. You can see Ephesus in the um, in the map right there. And now he's writing 2 Corinthians from Macedonia, where, is, where he went because um, he was led to go there instead of visit the Corinthian church at that time. Okay, remember Macedonia... Um, is where the Philip came from. Remember, Philip um, and Alexander came from Macedonia, so it's in the north of Greece, I believe, um, when they conquered Greece and became the most um, powerful empire in the world. But anyway, so Macedonia is very close by. He's writing the, sec the second Corinthians from there. So here's some information about second Corinthians. The author is Paul. The audience is the church at Corinth again. The date is about the same time that he wrote 1 Corinthians. Not a lot of time had passed from then, 55 to 56. And the purpose is the defense of Paul's apostleship. So in keeping in line with the fact that, um, that the whole book is about Paul's apostleship, here is a key verse that some people say is a verse that kind of explains the theme of the whole book. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 6. Porque no nos predicamos a nosotros mismos, sino a Jesucristo como Señor, y a nosotros como vuestros siervos por amor de Jesús. Porque Dios que mandó que de las tinieblas resplandeciese la luz es el que resplandeció en los, nuestros corazones para ilumina, iluminación del conocimiento de la gloria de Dios en la faz de Jesucristo. So this verse is saying what? What is it expressing as the theme of 1 Corinthians? That they're doing this for Jesus Christ. They're not doing this for themselves. They're not doing this to glorify themselves. And so Paul has no reason to theme here or fake his authority over them spiritually to help them and guide them as a pastor and a shepherd should do to do the right things for God, okay? So he's just basically saying there's no reason for people to send but our doubt in your mind about why we're doing what we do. We're not here to control you. We're here to help you live for God the way that God wants us to live. Okay, so there you go. That is the um, resume and the introduction to why 2 Corinthians was written. To help them understand and to not doubt why Paul was doing what Paul was doing, and for um, the motives that he had to guide them spiritually. Okay, so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and get into this book today. It says, Pablo, apóstol de Jesucristo, por la, la voluntad de Dios, y el hermano Timoteo a la iglesia de Dios que está en Corinto, con todos sus santos que están en, todo, en toda Acaya. Gracia y paz a vosotros, de Dios nuestra, nuestro Padre y el del Señor Jesucristo. Bendito sea el Dios y Padre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, Padre de misericordias y Dios de toda consolación, el cual nos consuela en todas nuestras tribulaciones, para que podamos también nosotros consolar a los que están en cualquier tribulación por medio de la consolación con que nosotros somos consolados por Dios. Porque de la manera que abundan en nosotros las afecciones de Cristo, así abunda también por el mismo Cristo nuestra consolación. Por, pero si somos atribulados, es para vuestra consolación y salvación. O si somos consolados, es para vuestra consolación y salvación la cual se opera en el sufrir las mismas aflicciones que nosotros también padecemos. Y nuestra esperanza respecto, respecto 
de vosotros es firme, pues sabemos que así como sois compañeros en las aflicciones, también lo sois en la consolación. Porque, hermanos, no queremos que ignoréis acerca de nuestra tribulación que nos sobrevino en Asia, pues fuimos abrumados sobre manera más allá de nuestras fuerzas, de tal modo que aún perdimos la esperanza de conservar la vida. Pero tuvimos nosotros mismos sentencia de muerte para que no confías, confiásemos en nosotros mismos, sino en Dios que resucitó, resucita a la, los muertos, el cual nos libró y nos libra, y en quien esperamos que aún nos librará de tan gran muerte, cooperando también vosotros a, a favor nuestro con la oración, para que mu por muchas personas sean dadas gracias a favor nuestro, por el don concedido, concedido a nosotros por medio de muchos. Porque nuestra gloria es esta, el testimonio de nuestra conciencia que con sencillez y sinceridad de Dios, no con sabiduría humana, sino con la gracia de Dios, nos hemos conducido en el mundo y mucho más con vosotros. Porque no os escribimos otras cosas de las que leís, leís o también entendéis y espero que hasta el fin las entenderéis como también en parte habéis entendido que somos vuestra gloria así como también nos, vosotros la nuestra para el día del señor jesús con esta confianza quise quise ir primero a vosotros para que tuvieses una segunda gracia y por vosotros pasar a Macedonia, y desde Macedonia venir otra vez a vosotros, y ser encaminado por vosotros a Judea. Así que, al proponerme esto, use quizá de ligereza, o lo que pienso hacer, lo que lo pienso según la carne, para que haya en mí sí y no. Mas, como Dios es fiel, nuestra palabra a vosotros no es sí y no. Porque el Hijo de Dios, Jesucristo, que entre vosotros ha sido predicado por nosotros, por mí, Silvano y Timoteo, no ha sido sí y no, mas ha sido en él. Porque todas las personas de Dios son en él. Y en él, amén, o sí, Perdón, porque todas las promesas de Dios son en él, sí, y en él, amén, por medio de nosotros para la gloria de Dios. Y el que nos confirma con vosotros en Cristo y el que nos ungió es Dios, el cual también nos ha sellado y nos ha dado las arras del Espíritu en nuestros corazones. Mas yo invoco a Dios por testigo sobre mi alma, que por ser indulgente, con vosotros no he pasado todavía a Corinto. No que nosotros, no que nos enseñoremos de vuestra fe, sino que colaboramos por, para vuestro gozo, porque por la fe estáis firmes. Ok, so let's get into the outline of this chapter today. Okay, so for verses 1 and 2, we see the credibility, okay, credibility that Paul is establishing. Remember, he knows that he is writing to defend his apostleship and his authority. Not in a proud way, you guys, but think about it. You have to be able to trust in your leader's authority, okay? And so he heard that that, that is being, um, like, disrespected. And that people are trying to sembrar doubt in people's minds, so he wanted to write to them to give them that confidence. So it says, Pablo Apostol de Jesucristo, por la voluntad de Dios. So he is an apostle, he's declaring it right there. He, which is a disciple, right? He is um, there for the will of God. El hermano Timoteo a la iglesia de Dios que está en Corinto, todos los santos que están en toda Acaya. Gracias, paz a vosotros de, no, de Dios nuestro Padre y del Señor Jesucristo. And we are family of God. So I am a disciple 
I am here for the will of God and we are in the family of God together. That is his credibility that he establishes. Okay, then we're going to go into my favorite part about this chapter, honestly, which is talking about that God is the God of comfort. And guys, this is a huge promise. Write this down. Mark this in your Bible. This is a promise that I think about a lot, a lot, a lot when I see people that I love going through hard times or that I'm going through hard times. This is like right out of the Psalms, but it's not a Psalm, okay? This is a promise of God that when we're going through hard times, it is going to be used in the life of somebody else to help them go through the same hard time. So look, if you are going, we were talking about like mental health and different stuff like that. And if you are going through this stuff that the psychology class is talking about, like take heart with it. Like be um, encouraged by the fact that God promises that what you go through right now is going to be used to console somebody else that's going to go through the same thing um, in their life and that you can be there to help that person. Look, we all know that the best help Human help comes from people, one, that love us, but two, that have gone through the same thing because they have wisdom to give you and they can tell you, look, there is light at the end of the tunnel because it will end. Okay, so look what it says in the verse um, 4, 2 Corinthians 1, 4. El cual nos consuela en todas nuestras tribulaciones para que podamos también nosotros consolar a los que están en cualquier tribulación por medio de la consolación con que nosotros somos consolados por Dios. So he will use it, you guys, and that's the coolest promise ever when you're going through a hard situation. Okay, so let's look at the um, outline for this. Verses 3 through 14, then there's going to be um, parts underneath it. Verses 3 through 14 is God's comfort in difficult circumstances. Okay, God's comfort in difficult circumstances, starting with verses 3 and 4. Use it to help others. So again, let me read it. Bendito sea Dios y Padre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, Padre de misericordias y, de, y Dios de toda consolación, el cual nos consuela en todas nuestras tribulaciones para que podamos también nosotros consolar a los que están en cualquier tribulación por medio de la consolación que con, con que nosotros somos consolados por Dios. So how are we going to be able to console other people? Because we are going to receive the consolation of God. Okay, we are going to receive the comfort of God. So it's a promise. There's two promises there, right? One, that God is going to help us, and two, he can use it to help other people. Super cool. I think that's one of the coolest, coolest promises that we have. Verses 5 through 7 is the afflictions come with consolation. The afflictions come with consolation. So what does that mean? That yes, anytime you see an affliction in your life, you're a Christian and you see an affliction in your life, the tribulation in your life, the trial in your life, you can be confident that the consolation of God is coming too. So there's a balance there that yes, he is going to let affliction in your life, but he's also then going to promise you the consolation that goes with it, okay, the consolation that goes with it. Look what it says in verse number five through seven. Porque de la manera que abundan en nosotros las aflicciones de Cristo, así abunda también por el mismo Cristo nuestra consolación. So it is a balance, okay? It's a balance, just like accounting. If you have an, um, a, a negative, you're going to have a positive, okay? It's a balance. Pero si somos atribulados, es para vuestra consolación y salvación. Okay, so it's for something, you guys. And it's for it's to receive the consolación, to be stronger, and to use it to help other people. So you, like, it's another huge promise, guys, to say what? Look, once you see that affliction comes in your life, you can stand firm on that and say, that means that the consolation of God is coming. That means it was for me to see something from God. And that it's going to be used to help other people in the future because he wants you to see how he's going to console you, how he's going to give you consuelo in this instance, and you're going to learn more about the love of God, and you're going to be more confident about the love of God, and you're going to use that to help somebody that's going through the same thing later on in your life or something similar, right? Look what it says. Um, keep going in verse number 
um, 6, o oh, si sí, somos consolados es para vuestra consolación y salvación, la cual se opera en el sufrir las mismas aflicciones que nosotros también padecemos. Ok, so, it's for our our consolation and our salvation okay he's there to rescue us yes he's going to allow it to happen but then he's there to consolar us y rescatarnos lo que says in verse number 7 y nuestra esperanza respecto de vosotros es firme pues sabemos que así como sois compañeros en las aflicciones también lo sois en la Consolación. Okay, so it says in English, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that you are partakers of the, of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. So again, you can have firm hope. Firm hope in what? That if affliction comes, the consolation also comes from God, and then it can be used by Him. Then, number eight through ten, He's also establishing His credibility. With being able to tell them that because he says we have suffered. So it talks about the suffering of Paul. I can tell you that it's okay to go through the go through afflictions, to go through tribulations, because consolation comes because I went through it and I received it. Look what it says in verse number eight through ten. Porque hermanos, no queremos que ignoréis acerca de nuestra tribulación que nos sobrevino en Asia. Pues fuimos abrumados sobremanera más allá de nuestras fuerzas, de tal modo que aún perdimos la esperanza de conservar la vida. Okay, so I'm going to read the other two verses, but what are you saying? Look, I want you to know, and again, this also establishes his credibility and his authority as a disciple, because look, why would he suffer for these things if it wasn't for God? Why would he suffer these things if it wasn't for helping them spiritually, right? So, he says, I want you to know, I don't want you to ignore the fact that we have been through so much stuff in Asia that we even lost confidence that we were going to live through it all. Okay? Pero tuvimos, in verse number 9, en nosotros mismos sentencia de muerte para que no confiásemos en nosotros mismos, sino en Dios que resucita de a los muertes. Okay? So, they had a sentence of that death. They believed that they were going to die, but they um, they learned that it was so that they couldn't trust in themselves, but only in the will of God. Only in the will of God that can raise from the dead. El cual nos libró y nos libra y en quien esperamos que aún nos librara de tan gran muerte. Okay? Um, so what is he saying? He's saying like we had to learn that we couldn't trust in ourselves. God taught us that, again, the affliction comes with consolation because what they, what they did is they got consoled by God and taught that, remember, it doesn't depend on you. It depends on God. Who can rescue you? Um, so that, that they could trust in his deliverance and his um, help and not in themselves. And then we see verses 11 through 14 interaction with the church so he, then he goes and kind of turns his focus on their part in it all cooperando también vosotros a favor nuestra nuestro con la oración para que por muchas personas sean dadas gracias a favor nuestro por el don concedido a nosotros por medio de muchos okay so he says you guys helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf okay so he says there's prayer involved okay and he's thankful for it verse number 12 porque nuestra gloria es esta el testimonio de nuestra conciencia que consenciéis y sinceridad de Dios, no con sabiduría humana, sino con la gracia de Dios, nos hemos conducido en el mundo y mucho más con vosotros. Okay, so I want to read that in English as well. For our rejoicing is this. So what do they get excited about? What are they regocijando in? Not in themselves, but in God and in this. The testimony of our conscience and in simplicity and godly sincerity and not with fleshly wisdom. They said that we know, we know, and we're here to tell you guys that in all sincerity and not with God and not with human wisdom, but with godly wisdom and all sincerity and the grace of God, 
we had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you or that we know that the word of God is in the world and in you because of what we've done. That's our testimony. Our testimony, we are rejoicing in the testimony that for everything that we went through, for getting to the point of death, for, um, for not knowing if we were going to live or, or die. It was so that the word of God was in the world, that our conversation is in the world, and especially to you, Lord, and that we know that you've heard it, that we know that you have the, will, the word of God because we never gave up. Okay, that was important to them, and it should be important to us. It's a beautiful, beautiful verse, you guys. Again, let me read it, verse 12. Porque nuestra gloria es esta, el testimonio de nuestra conciencia que consenciéis y sinceridad de Dios, no con sabiduría humana, sino con la gracia de Dios, nos hemos conducido en el mundo, y mucho más con vosotros. Okay, cool, huh? Okay, verse number 13 says, Porque no os escribimos otras cosas de la, la que leis, o también entendéis, y espero que hasta el fin las entenderéis. Okay, so we're writing to you what you need to know. Como también en parte habéis entendido que somos vuestra gloria. Um, así como también vosotros la nuestra para el día del Señor Jesús. It says in English, as also you have acknowledged us in part, that ye, we are your rejoicing, even as we, ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a mutual rejoicing there about what God is doing. Okay, they were, they were family of God together. Okay, and now the book takes a turn to finish it out by explaining why he did not come to Corinth, okay? I did read one that there probably was a visit from Paul between the first and the second letter, um, but then another one did not mention that, but he is talking about the fact that he is not there and why, okay? That plans had changed, and some people I can imagine, and I, I believe I read this as well, were using that to sembrar más duda because he said, look, in one thing he says he's going to come, and another thing he says he's not going to come, that's not a man of God, that he doesn't stick by his word, <clears throat> right? And so they're using that to sow doubt in the mind of the people, but he defends it, okay? Because Paul was always ready for a defense because he did things out of sincerity. He did things for their bien and not for his um, pride or anything like that, and that's what he's trying to explain here. So it says in verses 15 through 24, Con esta confianza quise ir primero a vosotros para que tuvieses una segunda gracia. That means like another benefit of me coming and like um, checking in on you and helping you and, and counseling you and preaching to you. 16 says, Y por vosotros pasar a Macedonia y desde Macedonia venir otra vez a vosotros y ser encaminado por vosotros a Judea. Así que, al proponerme esto, usé quizá de ligereza, o lo que pienso hacer lo pienso según la carne, para que haya en mí sí y no. Más como Dios es fiel, nuestra palabra a vosotros no es sí y no. Porque el Hijo de Dios, Jesucristo, que entre vosotros ha sido predicado por nosotros por mí, Silvano y Timoteo, no ha sido sí y no, más ha sido sí en él. Porque todas las promesas de Dios son el sí y en él. Amén. Por medio de nosotros para la gloria de Dios. Y el que nos confirma con vosotros en Cristo y el que nos ungió es Dios. El cual también nos ha sellado y nos ha dado las arras del Espíritu en nuestros corazones. Mas yo invoco a Dios por testigo sobre mi alma que por ser indulgente con vosotros no he pasado todavía a Corinto, no que nos enseñoremos de vuestra fe, sino que colaboramos por, para vuestro gozo, porque por la fe estáis firmes. Okay, so, um, so what is he saying? He's saying, look, some people are going to say that I, I was doing that for fleshly reasons. Okay, look what it says in verse number um, 15. In this confidence, I'm telling you with confidence and in your trust, I wanted to come to you. Okay, in verse number 16, I wanted to come to you, to pass by you into Macedonia and to come out again unto you. So he wanted to come on the way to Macedonia and on the way back from Macedonia. He wanted to come to 
them on the way to Hudea. Um, so he says, do you think that I did it lightly with ligereza? ligereza? Or do you think that I do it for the carne, that it's my desires, I just didn't feel like it, or I decided to go to Macedonia because it has better things or, or whatever they thought, and that you would find in me that I would say yes and no at the same time? Okay, which is very interesting, you guys, because what does it teach us about Paul? And what does it teach us about the culture there? And what does it teach us about how we should be for um, leaders for God as well? That our yes should be yes and our no should be no. Okay, they were sensitive to that. And, and so was Paul, though. He's saying, look, I would never say yes and no. I would never try to confuse you. I would never try to go back on my word. What I say, I do unless God changes it, right? So it's important for us the same thing. Look, if we commit to things, we go. And the only reason why we shouldn't go is if God changes the plan and changes his voluntad. Okay, so like we should be people of our word. And that's what Paul was saying. Like, how could you think that I'm not a person of my word? Or how could you think that I'm going to give you two words just so you're confused and you don't know what to trust in me? It says, 18, Mas como Dios es fiel, nuestra palabra a vosotros no es sí y no. Okay, it's of God. Okay, it says, um, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us and by others, was not yes and no. It was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are amen, and unto the glory of God by us. So he's saying, look, it was it was my plan, but God changed the plan, and we go with what God wants us to do. And he said it was actually a good thing, okay? Because um, verses 21 and 22, he's establishing more credibility. He says, now he that establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Okay, so he's saying, like, look, I'm I'm called of God, not called of men. So I'm answering to you to let you know that God has um, guided me through this. He also has sealed us, también nos ha sellado, and given the earnest of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Okay, so um, God anointed me, Jesus Christ established me, the Holy Spirit is inside my heart, and I call God as a testigo, right? He says that it was better that I didn't go to you. It says, basically, to me, it says in verse 23 and 24, Mas yo invoco a Dios por testigo sobre mi alma, que por ser indulgente con vosotros no he pasado todavía a Corinto, no que nos enseñoremos de vuestra fe, sino que colaboramos para vuestro gozo, porque por la fe estáis firmes. So, to me, it basically says this, like, he didn't want to come in a bad occasion again, okay? He had already had to be very hard on them. He had already had to, you know, regañarlos and scold them and speak to them very, very directly. And now he wanted to be able to come to them with gozo. He wanted to be able to come to them um, um, focusing on their gozo and increasing their joy in God. And not so much in what they were doing wrong. So he said, basically, the timing of God is perfect. It's better that I'm going to be able to come when you guys have worked these problems out. And I don't have to come. Because remember what he said in First Corinthians, I have no problem coming. But when I come, it's not going to be pretty, is basically what he says. If you're still in this stuff, it's not going to be pretty when I come. Okay? And so he didn't want to go through that again. He said, look, I've left you my word. Work it out. Let me come and enjoy go so with you that we're all doing what God wants us to do and we're all in the will of God. Okay, so he had a reason. So let's review what we saw in Corinthians. Verse 1 through 2, he's establishing his credibility. Look, I understand that there's doubt, he says. But I am an apostle. I am um, in, the, in the will of God. And we are together in the family of Christ. Verses 3 through 10. There is comfort in the difficult circumstances. I know because I've been through it. And you're going to go through it. And you're going to be used by God to help other people. But in verses 15 through 24. But my plans did change. But trust me. It wasn't for me and my carne and my flesh. That I just didn't feel like or I had other plans. No, it was of God. And it was better because now if I come to you, it's going to be that we can enjoy each other's fellowship with Goso because you have worked these things out and that I don't have to come in a, in a, a very negative, um, direct way. You know, and every authority is like that. 
No authorities, guys, love to always be there regañando. You guys know that with me. I want to enjoy you guys. I, I want to um, spend time with you. I want to laugh with you and learn with you. I don't want to be yelling at you and losing my patience with you and telling you that you've been irresponsible or anything like that. So we can all understand that, that the, the leader, you know, your moms and dads and your, and your tias and, and everybody, they don't want to be with you, you know, going, I know. ¿Qué está pasando? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? Now I have to beat you. Now I have to do this. No, they want to be there to enjoy you. You guys are great people. And that's what Paul said the same thing. I want to come and focus on your go so, you know, not focus on what um, uh, the problems are. So trust me on this, okay? Paul is very humble to answer these questions, guys. You know, what would have happened if you would have just said, well, that's your problem. That's your problem. That's what you think about me. Let, let them think what they think about me, right? But he didn't say that. Why? Because if he would have said that, what would have happened? They would have gone on thinking like that, and they wouldn't have learned from him. And in their mind, they wouldn't have trusted him. And then in their mind, they wouldn't have followed him to Jesus Christ, right? So he would be losing the opportunity to help them spiritually in their lives, which means and then they would be losing because of it. And so he decided, you know what? My pride, my feelings, that kind of stuff, doesn't matter. Their spiritual lives matter more to me. And that's huge. And that's leadership. And that's love. That's the love of God kind of love. Not human kind of love. Okay? Super, super cool to see that from Paul. So that's it for today, guys. Okay? Let's pray. And um, I hope you have an amazing day. And that's this is your responsibility for today, right? I don't think that there's anything else, yeah? So keep that calendar close to you. Don't mess up this week, you guys. Come on. You can do this. There's no reason why you cannot do this. It's not like I put any impossible goals there, okay? I put goals that you can do. And enjoy the projects because, to me, they're interesting, okay? And you're like, I know to you they are. Blah, blah, blah. No, they could be interesting to you as well. Hey, and they're better than sitting there studying for an exam. Yes or no? Mm-hmm. Yep. So enjoy. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today, and thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for your protection. This weather's been crazy lately, and um, you keep helping us um, just be protected, Lord. The coronavirus has been crazy, and you continue to protect us. So I pray that you continue to do that, but just help us um, learn so much from this book, Lord. Help us learn from Paul, his humility, his confidence his um, way to to defend you and to be loyal to you, even when there's opposition, and to always find the good, to always find the positive aspects in tribulations and in being accused of things that he didn't actually do. And I just pray that you help us to be leaders like that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye, guys. Love you. Have a great day.